Okay, welcome everyone to the Center for Governance and Markets virtual seminar series on networked governance. Can we govern ourselves digitally? My name is Jennifer Brick Mertazashvili. I'm the director of the center here at the University of Pittsburgh, where I teach in the School of Public and International Affairs. Uh, it's a real delight for us to have with us Professor Lawrence White, uh, who's coming to us from, uh, he's a professor of economics at George, uh, George Mason University. And he specializes in the theory and history of banking and money. He's the author of numerous books, including The Clash of Economics Ideas, The Theory of Monetary Institutions, and Free Banking in Britain. Um, today, he's going to present a paper called The Competitive Governance of Units of Account in the 21st Century. And uh, we're delighted to have Eric Alston with us. Eric is a scholar in residence in the finance division and the faculty director of the Hernando de Soto Capital Markets Program in the Leeds School of Business at the University of Colorado Boulder. Eric will be moderating the discussion and guiding us uh, through the rest of our conversation this afternoon. Uh, so just in terms of protocol, if any of you want to interrupt uh, Professor White, uh, today, please feel free to do so. You can do so in the chat function and then uh, Eric will um, interrupt. <laughs> so without further ado, Professor White, thank you for being here. It's a real honor for us to have you. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, but one correction, it's not really a paper. It's uh, a hastily thrown together slideshow. <laughs> right, right. But it draws, an, it, it draws on paper. a lot of papers and uh talks i've been giving and actually i learned some new stuff uh working on this uh, so let me uh, share it with you um, this is a seminar on governance i'm not sure whether i'm really talking about governance because it's a new, <laughs> a new topic to me i'm talking about monetary economics but you can tell me how it fits into uh, a governance framework because I'm mostly going to be talking about markets uh, and I don't know whether competitive governance is a, an oxymoron, but that was the title uh, Eric and I agreed on. So we'll go with that. Um, let's see, how do I make my page go down? No, that's not doing it either. Hold on. There we go. Uh, so let's begin with the emergence of units of account. Um, and units of account in the standard Mangarian story emerge together with a commonly accepted medium of exchange. So you've probably heard the story in a barter economy, people would be frustrated by the famous uh, lack of a mutual coincidence of wants and so they begin using indirect exchange. If you come to market with asparagus and you wanna go home with broccoli, but there isn't any broccoli seller who wants your asparagus, then you ask, what do you wanna be paid in? And if the broccoli seller says cabbage, then you say, ah, well, I can trade my asparagus for cabbage and use the cabbage to buy the broccoli. That's cabbage serving as a medium of exchange. When everybody's using the same medium of exchange, then it's a commonly accepted medium of exchange and that's the standard definition of what makes something money. It's to play the role of a commonly accepted medium of exchange. And Carl Menger emphasized that in this evolution, there isn't any collective decision that needs to be made. It's an invisible hand story. And so he was a critic of the state theory of money, which in early forms was already around, but which was promoted by uh, Georg Knapp in the 20th century. and uh, by modern monetary theory nowadays. Uh, in this story, the first commodity to emerge as a commonly accepted medium of exchange has to be a commodity, it has to be something useful, because the first people who accept it as payment really want to consume it, uh, other than the first person who stumbles on indirect exchange. So there can be one person using indirect exchange while others are just consuming this good. So it has to be either consumable or useful in a production process. Um, and then the unit of account role is derived or linked to the commonly accepted medium of exchange role. And the standard story is that in spot transactions, and, and 
this is argued in the paper that uh, Eric posted of mine from years ago. Uh, in spot transactions, you could post prices in terms of something you didn't really want to be paid in, but you just thought it was a better media, medium for posting prices for some reason. But that would make life difficult for your buyers. They would have to know what you really wanted to be paid in and what was the exchange rate you were accepting the stuff you really want to be paid in compared to the stuff you've posted prices in. Uh, so you could post prices in wheat and want to be paid in silver, but then everybody would have to know the silver to wheat exchange rate. It's called a unit of account because people keep their account books, their, they do their bookkeeping in it as well as post prices in it. And so to accurately compute your profits uh, as a business, you need to compare your income to your outgo. And if you're being paid in a certain medium of exchange, and you're buying your inputs in that same medium of exchange, then it's natural to want to compare those two magnitudes using the units that you're actually receiving and paying out. So that makes the bookkeeping unit of account uh, be tied to the commonly accepted medium of exchange. Now I discovered there's a recent paper uh, in Econometrica of all places on the emergence of a unit of account. Uh, by two German authors, Depke and Schneider. And they emphasize not the spot transactions, but the role of a medium of exchange and unit of account in credit transactions. So if you're borrowing and lending, uh, you want your payments, your repayments as a borrower, denominated in the same medium that you're receiving your income so that you don't have exchange rate risk between the income you're receiving and what you're obliged to pay out. Um, and an example that, that shows the wisdom of this by a contrast is a few years ago, there were some Polish lenders who thought the Zloty was too variable in its value and its purchasing power. So they began offering mortgages denominated in Swiss francs and they were made them attractive to people by offering a lower real interest rate on them. And people took out these mortgages. The problem was when the Zloty depreciated against the Swiss franc, these borrowers whose income was in Zlotys now had trouble repaying their mortgages. Um, so the banks got rid of the exchange rate risk, uh, sorry, got rid of the uh, fluctuating purchasing power risk, but substituted default risk. So there's a common principle in banking that you should, for the sake of prudence, run a matched book. You if you have assets in a currency, you should have liabilities in that currency and vice versa. So that change in the exchange rate doesn't change your net worth. It raises or lowers your assets and liabilities together. Uh, when I come to talking about Bitcoin, this is gonna be a problem. It's gonna be hard to get people to borrow money in Bitcoins before they have income in Bitcoins uh, and vice versa. It's going to discourage people from earning income in Bitcoin if their uh, debts are in dollars. So there's a, a sometimes called a who goes first problem, sometimes called a chicken and egg problem of trying to arrange for it to be both a medium of exchange and a unit of account adopted simultaneously when it's not in any single individual's private interest to, to go first. So uh, through the, an extension of the Mengarian logic, there's what you might call a naturally evolved system, natural in the sense that it's the result of market forces like a natural monopoly and not the result of state imposition. And so in a naturally evolved monetary system, you've got common media of exchange and only to a small extent did people use coined precious metal by say the late 19th century. They mostly used banknotes and bank deposits and those were both denominated in metallic units. It was a silver standard in most of the world up to the middle of the 19th century and then there was kind of a bandwagon of switching from the silver standard to the gold standard. Uh, but most people paid in bank issued money that was the commonly accepted medium of exchange, but denominated in the specie units for which it was redeemable. 
So you could say the specie was the meat that is coined precious metal. I realize that term's really not very familiar to people outside of pirate movies, but specie just means coined silver or gold. Uh, that was the medium of redemption and that was the unit of account. So the US dollar was simply a mass of gold or silver. It was originally defined in terms of silver, but then the law was revised in 1834 to define it in terms of both silver and gold. And that's called bimetallism, but de facto it was gold monometallism for reasons having to do with Gresham's law that I don't need to get into. The overvalued money drove out the undervalued money, and in this case, the gold drove out silver. So the dollar was defined as 23.2 grains of coined gold. Right? So the dollar was nothing other than a certain mass of specie. And this is the kind of system that prevailed in countries that minimally regulated their banking systems, uh, free banking systems, they're sometimes called. Uh, and Milton Friedman, although in 1960, he had been a skeptic about free banking. Uh, in 1986, Friedman and Schwartz wrote an article reconsidering Friedman's 1960 views. So I guess we have to give credit to Anna Schwartz for uh, changing his mind. <laughs> well, that and he uh, read the literature um, on free banking. And so Friedman and Schwartz in their article uh, emphasized that a common medium of exchange and a common unit of account can come about without government directing this evolution, uh, without there being a single producer of the medium of exchange, you can have many competing banks uh, who will choose to denominate their liabilities in the common unit of account and will try very hard to keep their liabilities at par because it's in their interest. Their customers want a money that remains at par at 100 cents on the dollar, not one that fluctuates against the money that their uh, trading partners are using. So it's not just that everybody is on the gold dollar standard, but the banks make sure their liabilities don't fall to a discount against the physical gold dollar. Uh, and Friedman and Schwartz make the point correctly that governments enter the picture after uh, markets or the community had settled on a common unit of account and media of exchange. Now there are cases in which there's a separation of the unit of account from the commonly accepted medium of exchange. And some writers in particular, Depke and Schneider recently have considered this separation natural. Um, they think it's natural in the absence of a debt market because they want to emphasize their model in which it's the debt market that drives them together. Um, but I don't think that's right. Uh, they're united under non-pathological circumstances even before we have deep financial markets. Uh, in particular, the, it, the separation happens under silver standards in Europe, and they cite examples of this, um, when the coins are debased. When the coins are debased, you don't want to post prices in terms of, let's say, ducats, because you don't know how much silver is going to be in a ducat that's actually brought to you. Uh, the Part of the main business of bankers in these days was to grade coins according to their purity and weigh them when people came in with a deposit, because coins, coins could be variously worn. Uh, and so they didn't just count coins the way we do today. They graded them for purity and they weighed them. And when people deposited silver coins that were a kind of a motley mass of different coins, different weights, different degrees of purity, to unify all that information, the bankers would keep account balances not in the names of coins because who knew what the coin was gonna be worth next month, but in pure units of silver. Uh, and since these units Right, so just weight units of silver. Since these units were not embodied in any actual coins, the coins were all variously debased or worn, they became known to economic historians by the rather mysterious name of ghost money. Uh, we're close to Halloween, so I guess that's appropriate. But a ghost money is simply a unit of silver mass that's not physically embodied in any particular coin, but it's 
it can be used as a reference for other coins. The other coins, the actual coins are silver. So it's a question of how much silver compared to this reference unit. Um, and I say this is not natural, but is instead the result of government intervention because this happens when the coins are debased and the coins being debased is not a natural phenomenon. It's the result of governments monopolizing the mints. Uh, when they monopolize, when a government monopolizes the mint, it doesn't really have to worry about keeping the quality up. It won't lose its customer base if it debases the coins. And of course there's a revenue motive to do that. Um, I recently wrote a paper, it's still available as a working paper uh, on SSRN if you wanna look it up. Uh, looking into the experience of private mints, because uh, that's my basis of comparison here, uh, in the US during the US gold rushes. And there were private mints that produced underweight coins, sometimes because they were incompetent and sometimes because they were deliberately uh, trying to earn some seniorage from debasement. Uh, but they didn't last. They were found out and people started refusing to accept their coins or accepting them only at a very deep discount. And so the uh, private mints that survived were private mints that didn't debase their coins. Competition uh, with the information on debasement being spread through newspapers compels private mints to keep their coins equal in value to the accounting unit in which they're denominated. So. Uh, the coins were the privately minted gold coins were denominated in dollars and they contain just as much in some cases more gold than the official coins from the US mint. Uh, this is part of the history of thought by now, I guess, but in the 1980s, I participated in debates over whether separation would be desirable. And um, it didn't come from Hayek who talked about denationalization of money. He thought of each new monetary unit being both a medium of exchange and a unit of account. So there's no separation there, but it's rather Greenfield and Jaeger in their article on a laissez-faire approach to monetary stability, who imagined a multi-commodity unit of account. And their objective was like Hayek's to stabilize the price level. They said, well, we can do it almost by definition by having a unit of account that consists of a broad basket of commodities. Now in their system, because there has to be conversion instantaneously uh, at any moment, somebody wants to make a payment, the basket has to be continuously traded standardized commodities. So basically what's on the Chicago Board of Exchange could be included in their basket. Uh, they took it for granted that that basket would be stable in terms of the consumer price index. That's, that's not all actually clear that it's all that stable or any, that it's much more stable than simply having a single commodity standard like a gold or silver standard. Anyway, they were inspired by earlier papers by Fisher Black and Eugene Fama and Robert Hall. Um, and the piece that Eric put on, uh, up for reading, it was kind of my reply to that literature. And a friend of mine said, well, it's, it's a shame that Fisher Black never responded to your piece because then you could have had the black white debate. So we missed out on that. Um, but my criticism of that system was that, look, you need instantaneous settlement to run a modern monetary system. And if you separate the unit of account from the physical stuff that ownership of which is transferred to settle, then you have to bridge the bid ask spread every time you do that. Uh, it's okay in a, in a Valrasian world of zero uh, bid ask spreads. And I think that's kind of what Fama had in the back of his mind, a kind of extreme arbitrage assumption, which is fine for some purposes but uh, not for understanding monetary exchange. So that was a criticism. I don't think uh, separation is something that uh, is desirable either by people using a money or by uh, the clearing system. 
Okay, but we know governments did get involved. And this famous quote from uh, Keynes explains uh, that the age of state money or the age of charterless money uh, was reached when the state claimed the right to declare what thing should answer as money to the current money of account. So Keynes is putting the unit of account at the center of the story and saying it's up to the state to decide what goods constitute a dollar. Uh, and it's one thing if they make that declaration just once and leave it alone. Um, and my earlier argument is they don't even ha need to make the declaration. The market will converge on something and court cases will sort out what is the precise content of a gold dollar or a silver dollar. But it doesn't make much difference as long as the definition doesn't change. But then Kane, Keynes adds, when the state claims the right not only to enforce the dictionary, but also to write the dictionary. So when they claim the right to devalue the gold content of the dollar, then we've got not a natural monetary system, but a state monetary system. Uh, and I think he's right about that. So we are currently in a charterless age. Uh, so the state theory of money in that sense, although it's not a good theory of the origin of money, uh, it does describe the system we're under now. Uh, and we can see that, I, I like to amuse my students with this uh, picture by comparing the Federal Reserve note back when it was redeemable to the Federal Reserve note today. So when it was redeemable, the dollar was defined in terms of precious metal. It said, we'll pay to the bearer on demand $100, right? Not this itself defines what is a dollar, but we will pay you $100, meaning in gold coins. But after the uh, removal of redeemability, so the first one was 1930 and the second was 1993, it doesn't say we'll pay the bearer on demand. It says ribbon, 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 $100. This is $100. So that's a literal fiat, a fiat being a decree or a declaration uh, that this is money. And so there's a subtle change uh, in the meaning of dollar, but the name dollar continues to be used. So that's the state rewriting the dictionary, rewriting what a dollar refers to. Now, once you have a commonly accepted uh, unit of account, uh, there isn't much demand for alternative units of account. Uh, I don't want to say zero because I'll talk about cases in which people do use niche monies. But if you look at the privately minted California gold coins, they didn't come up with their own unit. They didn't denominate it in ounces or grams or anything that people weren't familiar with. They denominated it in gold dollars and they adhered to the official definition of how many grams of pure gold were in a dollar. And likewise, although apparently uh, Peter Thiel had other ideas when they first started uh, the PayPal project, he had the idea of having a Hayekian alternative currency. He quickly discovered that nobody wanted that and he turned PayPal into a dollar transfer system um, and got very rich doing it. There was a demand for a convenient dollar transfer system. Now, uh, some economists have looked for rationales for government to get involved in deciding what is the commonly accepted medium of exchange and the unit of account. And so they've looked for or offered public goods explanations or externality arguments, market failure arguments. One of which is that markets may fail to give rise to a common enough unit of account. Um, and so the externality might be, if I choose to use a money that other people are using, I'm conferring a benefit on them. But if I'm not compensated for doing that, then I may have too little incentive to provide this benefit to them. And I think that's wrong. I think they give me an incentive to use the same money they're using by offering me better prices if I pay in the same money. If I wanna pay in some oddball money that they're not using, they're gonna say, look, that's a hassle to me. I have to go trade it, pay uh, 
a fee to exchange it for the money I want to use. So I'm going to give you a lousy price in the money you're offering. That's giving me an incentive to use the money they're using. It's like a bribe. So the gains are shared mutually by trading partners, then they're internalized. Right? It's not a benefit that just showers down on people randomly. It's a benefit among trading partners, and so it's internalized. Um, and in fact, it's the sharing of that benefit that drives the Mengarian convergence from some people using peppercorns and some using salt and some using copper to everybody using the same uh, medium of exchange and unit of account. And that is, it's easier to make trades if you adopt the money that's being used by the most other people. So popularity becomes self-reinforcing in that way. There's a strong network property uh, to a money, to a monetary standard. And when everybody joins, then you can't say that there's been under joining. Uh, there, there's not a common enough unit of account. So that's not a problem, but maybe the market converges too slowly. So we see all kinds of battles among technical standards high definition DVD versus Blu-ray. And people sometimes say, well, this is taking too long to converge. Maybe we should speed it up through some kind of intervention. Uh, of course, it's dangerous to do that. The government may not choose the standard that the market would have converged to, or maybe I should say it may not choose the standard that's technically best. Uh, the, standard that's technically best, there's going to be market forces to produce that standard. Uh, technical experts are going to recommend it. The reason we have the JPEG standard in picture compression is that JPEG stands for the Joint Pictures Expert Group. They recommended this standard so that everybody could get on the same page, uh, and it helped. The case of the Euro is a case where the government uh, of the European Union or the, the signatories to the uh, European Central Bank Treaty decided to, uh, on a schedule for introducing the euro and for converting all accounting at, and at what rates other national currencies were going to be converted into euros. And so that was all very much uh, prearranged. And in a case like that, where the decision has already been made, then it makes sense to ease the transition uh, through those kind of measures. But the bigger question is, should that decision have been made? Um, and I think it's still an open question in the case of the Euro. It's certainly the case that many countries would not have joined had they had a public referendum on it. So Denmark had a referendum and chose not to join. Sweden had a referendum, chose not to join. Germany did not have a referendum. <laughs> because the government wanted to join and knew that the people did not want to join. So it's not clear that that's a welfare improvement uh, from the point of view of ordinary German citizens uh, to join the Euro. But in the high inflation European countries, uh, it was an improvement. So to say that the government should choose uh, when there's a change from one established money to a new money uh, is to have some reason to think that market choices have not converged on the best unit of account or the best medium of exchange. And maybe they converged on what was the best money at that time, but now we're locked into it and technology has changed so we can have a better money, but we need to coordinate the switch over. Uh, one expression of this idea that government gets involved, should get involved, comes from a kind of surprising place, which is from Jim Buchanan. And while he was my colleague at George Mason, uh, he used to say this. And he said it in an essay that was in a volume I edited a few years, uh, co-edited a few years ago, uh, called The Value of Money as a Constitutionalized Parameter. And you have to realize that constitutionalized here is by contrast to market evolved. 
right? So he says the monetary structure of a market economy should be constitutionalized rather than allowed to emerge anarchistically. And what he means by anarchistically is through market forces. Nobody's advocating you know, doing away with the legal system and then waiting for the best money to emerge. Uh, it emerges through exchange and exchange assumes a uh, certain respect for property rights and the, the like. Uh, and then Buchanan has a definite idea about what makes for the best money. And it's not, surprisingly for Buchanan, not let's defer to the public and let them choose, but rather stability in the unit is the aim. So I think this is uncharacteristic of him to decide what's good for people and say, therefore, uh, it should be brought about through collective action. But this is the uh, concern that the economy got, might get locked into an inferior unit of account. Uh, there are lots of examples of economies on commodity standards switching to a better commodity. So Menger used the example of ancient Greece switching from using oxen as medium of exchange and unit of account to using copper coins. And the copper coin I've got a picture of here has an ox head on it to signal to people what the ox is, that the coin is doing what the ox used to do. Uh, the second picture is copper plate money from Sweden. Uh, Sweden had a copper standard until they came into contact with areas that were using a silver standard and quickly discovered that silver was a lot more convenient than for carrying a small silver coin was a lot more convenient than carrying a big copper plate of the same value around the marketplace. Uh, and then of course there's the switch from silver to gold in the middle of the 19th century and that uh, governments did get involved in because it doesn't, it's not clear that gold is technically better than silver. It's true that it's more precious so that if the ratio is 16 to one, you could pay in 16 boatloads of silver or one boatload of gold, and that would be more convenient. But by the time people were making large value payments in precious metal, they were using banks. They were not sending shiploads of metal. So I don't think the greater preciousness of gold made a big difference. And the purchasing power of gold wasn't any more or less stable than silver, as far as I can tell. Question, Eric. That was just your rough five minute warning. That being, okay. said, um, that being said, feel free to flex further into the Q&A time, um, okay. because we do have some flex time for discussion at the end. And your, your talk's quite interesting. Okay. I knew I was gonna spend a long time before I got to digital world, but here we go. So uh, bringing us to the digital world, some enthusiasts for Bitcoin, Libra, Ripple have hoped that in a digital world, it's gonna be easier for new monies to get a foothold, right? So they're aware of the network property of money, uh, but they say, look, we have examples of people like the ones I just gave of people spontaneously switching uh, from one money to what they think is, is a better money. So it's even easier to do that in a world where, as in the picture, we can have digital price tags that display both the dollar price of the shirt and the up to the minute Bitcoin price of the shirt. So if you wanna pay in Bitcoin, you know how many Bitcoin it's gonna cost you. Uh, some of the, uh, the proposals for new methods of payment uh, can be sorted into two categories, those that involve a new unit of account and those that don't. So I'm not gonna say much about stable coins or central bank digital currency because although those are new front ends to the transaction, the back end is the same. It's a transfer of dollar denominated deposits. All right, so they don't introduce a new unit of account. A stable coin is something transferable through crypto markets, sellable on crypto exchanges, but which is tied to an existing fiat money, 
So there are dollar stable coins, there are euro stable coins, gold stable coins. Uh, I've been waiting for somebody to introduce a CPI stable coin, but it's a technically difficult problem. Uh, but take the first five. So I'll talk a little about Libra, which was the project that Facebook was promising, or if you're a central bank threatening to introduce. Uh, Bitcoin, Ripple is an alternative cryptocurrency. It's interesting in that it's organized differently. Uh, Bitcoin was launched as a kind of nerd project. It was launched by people who just wanted to see whether it could be done. Uh, and then they became, began to think about actually making it into a currency and began promoting it uh, to do that. But it was mostly for the proof of concept uh, that it was actually launched. So it's not run by any corporation, right? The code is just out there. Whereas Ripple is run by Ripple Labs. It's a for-profit firm. Uh, it relies on a different validation mechanism for transactions. And most of the Ripple, well, all the Ripple in existence was, has already been mined. It doesn't rely on a mining mechanism. And most of it is held by the people who started Ripple. And they have this practical problem of how quickly to release it so that they can diversify their wealth without depressing the price too much. Ampleforth is a new project which stabilizes uh, the purchasing power of the Ampleforth coin in much the way that a money market mutual fund maintains a $1 per share value by increasing and decreasing the number of shares in your account. So if the demand for Ampleforth goes up, they issue more Ampleforth. And if it goes down, they buy it back. Uh, and I've listed gold here because the new payment technologies are making it possible to transfer gold through uh, blockchain transactions. So the first step is to do what's called tokenizing the gold. So each bar of gold, which has a unique identifying serial number, gets a token, a unique token, which matches that bar of gold and you can transfer ownership of the token. That's just as good as transferring uh, ownership of the gold through other means. The token gives you the right to withdraw the gold if you want to, but mostly the payments are gonna be made by transferring ownership of the bars without actually moving the bars. Uh, and so it'll be interesting to see how much that takes off, but Actually, I'm going to be skeptical about how much that's going to spread uh, along with these others. Uh, and let me explain why. Uh, there's an obstacle uh, that I referred to earlier as the who goes first problem. But to be more technical about it, the problem is bridging the bid ask spread between monies. If you're using a niche money, so if you're getting uh, your salary in dollars, but you want to hold and spend Bitcoin, then you have to convert your dollars to Bitcoin. So you have to go through an exchange where you'll have to bear the bid ask spread, uh, right? The, the currently bid or offered price um, for your dollars in terms of Bitcoin is a little bit below the price people are asking uh, and so you have to go up and hit the higher price in order to make an exchange. And then if you then want to spend your Bitcoin for goods that are priced in dollars by people who actually want to receive dollars, you have to make the conversion back again. So you have to bear that expense again. Uh, it may be uh, small, it may be 1% or less, but when we're talking about uh, big volume transactions that adds up and as I argued earlier, in the case of clearing systems, we're talking about billions of dollars being changing hands every day. Uh, people don't wanna bear that cost by trying to pay in something other than what the recipient party wants to receive. Uh, 
So bid ask spreads make it more costly to uh, accept payment in a, a unique money, a niche money, or in some kind of sophisticated barter system in shares of IBM or which is our treasury bills, which was the sort of thing people were talking about uh, in the 80s. And a place where we see this working out is in uh, foreign exchange markets. Um, I'll come back to that example in a second. So the, the existence of bid-ask spreads won't disappear with improvements in information technology. And this is the point made in an important paper by Malte Kruger. Uh, according to estimates he cites, order processing is a little less than half of the cost borne by market makers. 43% of it is adverse information and 10% is the cost of holding inventories. And I need to explain what the adverse information is, but advances in information technology won't shrink that. All right, so suppose you're a market maker, you're holding an inventory and you're ready to sell when a buyer comes up to the ask price and you're willing to buy if the seller comes down to the bid price. If you can make both those deals at the same time, you earn the whole spread. But if you make them one by one, you have to worry that the person who's buying knows something you don't know about the price being about to go up. So that's inf adverse information. Because if that's true, when you go to replenish your inventory, you're not gonna get it at the current lower of the two prices. You're gonna have to come up uh, to replenish your inventory. If everybody knows before you do that the price is rising, uh, that's gonna raise your cost of restocking. If you had a zero spread as a market maker, then you'd always lose when other people get the news ahead of you. So you need something there to uh, absorb that risk. And that's what the adverse information part of the bid ask spread is about. So in foreign exchange markets, you don't observe every currency being traded for every currency. You cannot trade Australian dollars for euros, even though those are rather large currencies. It's actually cheaper to trade your Australian dollars for US dollars and then US dollars for euros. 88%, I just looked this up, 88% of foreign exchange trades involved the US dollar on one side. So that was the top 13 currency pairs were all dollar pairs. Number 14 was euros against uh, British pounds. So it's cheaper for this because the bid ask spreads are so much smaller because the volume is so much bigger to go via the US dollar even when you don't wanna end up with US dollars. It's like flying in a hub and spoke system. You can get a cheaper fare by flying on more crowded planes and to do that, you gotta go through the hub. So uh, Kruger's Conclusion from that, which I share, is that the use of a common medium of exchange and unit of account makes the market more liquid and that reduces transaction costs, reduces bid ask spreads, and that whether information technology is very advanced or whether it's crude. Uh, so, if I can just quickly say something about the Libra project. Initially, the Libra project was supposed to uh, issue a currency which was somehow, it was a little vague, uh, tied to a synthetic unit of account, the Libra, consisting of a basket of six fiat currencies, the, the fiat currencies with the lowest in, uh, inflation rates. So it was the dollar, the Swiss franc, the Singapore dollar, the British pound, I think, and a couple of others. Uh, I don't see any reason that would have gained traction. There's not much benefit if you get income in dollars and buying goods denominated in dollars to want to hold your transaction balances in something else, even if that something else is a little better insulated against exchange rate risk, that only matters to you if you're planning to make purchases in the other currencies that make up the basket. Right? You don't have an exchange rate risk if your income is in dollars and your purchases are in dollars. There's no reason to diversify away from that. 
Um, this is why if you're planning to retire in the US, your retirement funds should be in dollars. <laughs> Uh, so the, the foreign exchange fees would swamp any uh, benefits you get uh, unless your domestic currency is really terrible. So the appeal of the Libra might have been to people who live in countries where there's high inflation. But then it's not easy to see why the Libra would be more attractive to them than U.S. dollars. And I think the uh, people coming up with the Libra, projecting the Libra, have caught on to this. Uh, well, it's partly that and partly they're being browbeat by regulators. But in their latest statement, they say, uh, we're not just going to have our multi-currency coin. That'll depend on whether anybody wants it. We will also support single currency stable coins. And what they're selling then is a payment processing system, not a new currency. So like PayPal. Uh, can Bitcoin become a wider medium of exchange and unit of account? Well, it's, it's got this chicken and egg problem. It's hard to get a critical mass, but especially in the case of Bitcoin, it's a very volatile uh, unit of account. Its purchasing power bounces around a lot more than the dollar or the euro or even gold. And so that makes it risky, even riskier to hold your transaction balances uh, in Bitcoin. You don't want to hold your rent money in Bitcoin. It may drop 10% tomorrow. Uh, a former student of mine named Cameron Harwick had a very good article about this. It's in the Independent Review, if you want to look it up, saying, well, this is what makes the dollar supply so elastic as to stabilize its value from day to day is the banking system. The banking system expands and contracts as people want to hold more bank issued currency or we no longer have bank issued banknotes, but bank issued deposits. People want to hold bank issued money. The banking system will provide it to them. Bitcoin doesn't have that. Therefore, it doesn't have any supply elasticity because it's a vertical supply curve for Bitcoin according to the uh, source code. It doesn't respond to price. And so changes in demand are fully reflected in price and not at all in quantity. So that's a built-in problem with Bitcoin and that kind of volatility make, makes it hard to attract people who want to use it as a medium of exchange away from other monies. It doesn't deter people who want to hodl, who want to acquire Bitcoin and keep it for five years. Those day-to-day -day fluctuations don't really matter to them as long as the long run trend is up. Right? But it does discourage its use as a medium of exchange. A second problem, but maybe there's a technical fix for that, is congestion on the Bitcoin network. So there may be a, a technical fix for that, we'll see. But it was a problem in 2017. So most Bitcoin use is not for buying goods and services. It's for speculating on other currencies, something like 90% plus of Bitcoin transactions are against dollars or euros or Chinese yuan. It is sometimes used to buy goods and services on the dark web. We don't have much information about those transactions, but we know they're there. Uh, it is possible for a brick and mortar retailer to accept Bitcoin. So this is the Peruvian brothers chicken truck in DC. They accept payment in Bitcoin. It's true that I copy and pasted the Bitcoin sticker on their truck. That's not really there, but that's the spirit of it. Uh, but of course, when they accept Bitcoin, they don't really get Bitcoin. They use a payment processing service that pays them in dollars. They're, the wages they pay are in dollars. All their inputs are in dollars. So they need dollars. Uh, but intermediaries like Coinbase and BitPay allow retailers to accept Bitcoin, except in quotes, uh, because actually Coinbase and BitPay accept the Bitcoin and give the retailer dollars or euros or whatever the retailer wants. Just like if you're a European shopping in the US, you can buy stuff with your MasterCard and the US retailer receives dollars from MasterCard. And when you go home to Europe, you get a bill denominated in euros. So BitPay is doing the same thing uh, between Bitcoin and dollars. 
And the fees are reasonable. They're in the neighborhood of 3%. They do have a bid ask spread to cover, but uh, so do MasterCard and Visa. Uh, and Bitcoin doesn't have any chargeback risk, unlike uh, credit cards. So there are ways, it's not that there isn't a technology and on the front end. Uh, the question is what's the benefit to users? And it, there isn't much benefit if other people aren't also using it so that you can spend it directly. Now there is one place, another niche where Bitcoin has been adopted as a medium of exchange and that's in altcoin markets. So go back to 2016 and you could find this information. Uh, trading pairs for other cryptocurrencies were all against Bitcoin. So other cryptocurrencies, so XMR is Monero, ETH is Ether, uh, were priced in terms of Bitcoin. Bitcoin was the unit of account and it's because it's what the sellers of those other currencies wanted to be paid in. Uh, so I went to update this slide and it turns out it's not true anymore. It's, Bitcoin has lost its dominance even in this market. It's lost it to US dollar tether. So on the exchange Binance, uh, I was able to find this graph this morning, US dollar tether, which is a dollar linked stable coin is used in 92% of the transactions uh, for buying other cryptocurrencies. So uh, I'm not saying that the US dollar is uh, the greatest currency in the world. I myself, uh, I'm rather fond of the classical gold standard and people should be allowed to use Bitcoin and should be allowed to use gold, but I don't predict that just allowing it will enable either of those uh, to sweep the market. It's going to take a fall in the reliability of the US dollar. And of course, that's when we do see people change voluntarily, spontaneously change the currency they're using. We see dollarization when the domestic currency cracks up. We're seeing it in Lebanon, we're seeing it in Argentina, Venezuela, in countries like that. But it's revealing, I think, that people in those countries are switching to the US dollar. They're not switching to Bitcoin. Uh, dollar is just a lot more spendable than Bitcoin. Uh, just because of its incumbency advantage, even uh, and then on top of that, Bitcoin's value is rather volatile. So that's the end of my slideshow. And I will be happy to take questions. Excellent. Thanks so much, Larry. That was, uh, that was really interesting. And um, I'm glad we went over time so we could get your thoughts on, on specifically some of the digital currencies. I'm gonna exercise my moderator's prerogative and ask you a, a first question. And this comes directly from your uh, recommended background research for informing this talk. Your quote is, paper money is able to function as the basic medium of exchange because it previously functioned as a secondary medium of exchange. So I guess what I'm wondering is, what, what are your thoughts on what this process looks like or this emergent process might look like in the digital realm? Because I take your, your discussion to paint some pretty salient obstacles to Bitcoin, let alone any other cryptocurrency, toppling the dollar anytime soon, serving both of these roles as a unit of account and medium of exchange. Are you more sanguine about things like the digital yuan that the Chinese government is experimenting with? Do you envision a future world where we have a multi-reserve system or are the coordinative benefits of a single, single unit of account so great that it's likely we'll have a single unit or single backbound unit, notwithstanding some of the competitive benefits that we are seeing? So when I said that about paper money, I was referring to the transition from banknotes that were redeemable in gold and silver to fiat money, which is no longer redeemable. So people were accustomed to having dollars stamped on a piece of paper. And as uh, the system matured in the late 19th century, people very seldom had any occasion to redeem for gold coins. Uh, gold coins were something people got on their birthdays, but 
most people didn't carry them around. They used banknotes and checks to make most purchases. So they were accustomed to them. Uh, and so when the redemption option was taken away, there was no reason to stop uh, using dollar denominated Federal Reserve notes or actually private uh, bank notes. Um, well, actually the commercial banks in the US continued to issue bank notes up until the 1930s and they stopped about the same time that ownership of monetary gold was outlawed uh, for US citizens. So it was illegal from 1933 up to 1974, I think it was. So um, does digital technology change the opportunity or the, uh, the likelihood of having multiple competing units of account? I don't think it does. Uh, so the digital one is denominated in an established currency and in the transition, it's going to be interchangeable. And likewise, uh, US dollar stable coins are interchangeable with US dollars in the normal digital form, which is in the form of a bank account, because bank accounts are already digital money. Uh, but stable coins are digital dollars outside the banking system. And if you're they have some of the advantages of cryptocurrencies to people who want to conduct business outside the banking system, either for lower fees or for greater privacy. And because they're not introducing a new monetary unit and because they're interchangeable, they don't face the same obstacle to acceptance that Bitcoin faces in being used as an ordinary medium of exchange. Uh, I didn't mention this, but one of the interesting things that's being, been happening in the recent dollarizations is that uh, people in Lebanon and Argentina are using dollar stable coins. That's another way to put your savings in dollars that can be easier to get to uh, than having a dollar denominated bank account, especially if it's illegal to have one, then you have to either, you know, travel to Uruguay if you're in Buenos Aires to open a bank account. Uh, in Lebanon, I don't know where you go. It's, it's legal in Lebanon, but you should worry if you're a Lebanese citizen, the government will confiscate those dollar denominated bank accounts. But it's gonna be hard for the government, harder for the government to confiscate uh, dollar stable coins, just like it's harder them for, for them to confiscate Bitcoin. Uh, so I don't see a big enough advantage for Bitcoin if, if the US dollar becomes unstable and the Euro becomes unstable and all the major currencies become unstable, then what's next? What can people resort to? Um, there's actually a bigger installed base of monetary gold than there is of Bitcoin. There's something like $10 trillion in gold coins, bullion, and exchange traded funds owned by private individuals. It isn't easily transferable, but that's coming. So that's maybe more likely if there's a breakdown of all the fiat monies. But I don't think a breakdown of all the fiat monies is likely, and of course, I wouldn't wish for it. Um, so to change away from the ex existing fiat standards is going to be hard. Uh, people are free to put themselves on, should be free to put themselves on alternative standards and some portion of their savings, it's prudent to do that. But there isn't that big an attraction to put your ordinary everyday transaction balances, as long as you're being paid in dollars and you buying groceries in dollars, that money you're not going to switch to something else. Gotcha. Yeah. And I think this harkens back to one of your first points. The currency you're paid in can really matter a lot. And I lived in Cuba in the summer of 2001, when they had only recently begun to legalize the convertibility of dollars and euros due to the level of black market transactions were occurring. And when you the say convertibility, you mean just made it legal to trade them? 
Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and so you're kind of getting at a big distortion that they created in so doing, which was all of the state jobs paid in pesos at an exchange rate that was defined by the government. And unsurprisingly, that exchange rate was far, far lower than the prevailing exchange rate on the streets. But this created actually a real problem for the application of human capital, which was that state paid doctors and lawyers wanted to become taxi drivers and waiters in restaurants because they could obtain the euros and dollars. And so that mismatch between what you're paid in and the prevailing, you know, unit of account and medium of exchange is, is can be quite poignant in practice. Um, but we have, a, we have an audience question. It was posed first in the chat, but um, I'll turn it over to that audience member, Anthony uh, Tusakina. Yeah, hi, uh, thanks, and um, a wonderful talk. Um, I, my question really was prompted by your discussion uh, of, of Libra, but I think it's, uh, you've, you've touched on it, both you and Eric have touched on it in, in, in the discussion we just had, and that is, uh, you know, what about the value of, uh, the, you know, uh, cryptocurrencies to uh, to be able to move and function outside of the established fiat rails, right? Um, you know, aside from a, you know, from just a, from a pure cost perspective, right? It's it's it can be cheaper uh, to to move uh, crypto along crypto rails than to move fiat along fiat rails. Um, and in some in some um, in some situations, it may it may not even be possible or may not be uh, desirable to move along the fiat rails. No, you're right. I could have, I should have said more about that when I said there is, when I talked about the niche uses of Bitcoin that are happening now. So in addition to uh, activity on the dark web and a few brick and mortar retailers, there's also international remittances and payments and transfers uh, in cryptocurrencies, in Bitcoin in particular. Uh, but of course, that's the market that Ripple is specifically aiming at, the remittance market. Because it's faster and cheaper than old fashioned methods. Uh, but the competition from uh, rebittance, as it's sometimes called, the competition from Bitcoin and Ripple has actually brought down fees on Western Union and MoneyGram uh, to where they're much cheaper than they used to be. In some markets where they face especially strong competition, it's gone from 10% down to something like 3%. Uh, but yeah, we there are lots of stories out there of, I don't know, workers, Philippine workers in Hong Kong who send their wages back home through Bitcoin just because it's cheaper. Uh, and people in Venezuela, uh, there was an interesting story in the news of a guy in Venezuela who makes his living writing and consulting for people outside Venezuela and the easiest way to get paid is in Bitcoin. And then he has a local market where he converts it to Bolivars to do his shopping. Uh, and to the extent that it's less easily censored than dollar transfers, that's a niche uh, for Bitcoin. So we had a we had another question in the chat from uh, Curtis Smith surrounding the widespread adoption of dollars as linked to uh, mon or the U.S. dollar monetary supply. Curtis, do you want to ask your question? You're muted, actually. Uh, That, that was my question, just almost like what you said. Is, is the widespread use of the US dollar somehow linked to the big expansion of the monetary expansion, which you gave us as 37 times last week, two weeks ago? Um, oh, well, the I'm not sure what 37 times refers to, but yeah, over over the 20th century, uh, of course, the US government has been everywhere in the world. And that, for better or worse, has spread the use of dollars. But coming out of World War II, the Bretton Woods system made the United States dollar the key currency. Uh, and the US was, government was able to negotiate that because they held all the cards. All the European countries were in debt to them. So they went along with it. And so the dollar became the key currency and that 
invoicing of international trade in dollars uh, has persisted through these kind of network economies. So as long as the dollar is reasonably stable in value, even two companies outside the US, neither of which uses dollars in their domestic economy, will still make payments uh, to one another in dollars because they can use the dollar income to buy the inputs that they wanna buy from other suppliers. So it's, it's like everybody's second currency, but it especially dominates uh, international trade. Now, there is a, the US government seems to be putting up obstacles to that by trying to leverage their control over the banks in New York as an instrument of foreign policy. And that actually threatens the continued dominance of the dollar because other countries are gonna say, well, if I have accounts in New York, they could be seized, right? Iran found, found this out. Other countries have found this out. Um, so the use of sanctions involving boycotting or uh, not allowing payments to certain countries uh, is going to make some countries resort to other currencies. Um, now, what other currency are you going to use? Is the European Central Bank going to be independent of the U.S. when it comes to imposing sanctions on Iran, let's say? Hmm, not clear. Well, how about the Chinese yuan? Well, can you trust the Chinese government not to censor the payments or impose its own pressures on what you have to do to maintain, uh, to stay in good standing? So those kind of geopolitical issues get involved in the continued dominance of the US dollar, but uh, for now, there hasn't been any move away from it uh, other than the introduction of the Euro. So that took a big chunk of trade out of uh, going in US dollars, but it's stabilized since then. The Euro has not risen to the size of the US dollar in international markets, despite some predictions. So an interesting uh, question in the chat from Ash Navabi. Um, Ash, do you want to ask it directly? I'm happy to read it out for you if, uh, if that's more convenient to. Uh, I'll try uh, reading out loud. Hello, Professor White. Thank you Hi, for Ash. the very interesting talk. Um, a few years ago, you were named as a co-author for the economic model for an upstart digital currency by the name of Initiative Q. Yep. Uh, can you speak to the comparative stabilization mechanisms between it, Bitcoin, and Libra? Or if that's too broad a topic, uh, how would Q address the UOA camo problems you discussed today? Okay, so first point to make is that uh, Initiative Q was named before QAnon and has nothing to do with it. <laughs> uh, but the idea, and it wasn't my idea, I was uh, hired by the guy who came up with it to help him write uh, a monetary policy white paper uh, the basic idea, as I understand it, is out of high X denationalization of money. It's going to be a private currency where the quantity is manipulated to move with demand so that the purchasing power remains stable. Uh, an algorithm has not been written, and the details of how to get the governing body, because this is going to be a private uh, corporation, uh, how to get them to adhere to what they promised to do, that has yet to be worked out. So it's very much in uh, a, even not even a beta stage, it's a pre-beta stage. It's still looking for venture capital to launch it on a large scale. The, it, the uh, entrepreneur here, a guy named Sar Wilf, understands the chicken and egg problem very well. So his first move has been to sign up account holders. And to incentivize new account holders, his, it's, it's a clever idea, I think. He said, look, I will give you some Q. And it may never amount to anything because it may never be widely adopted. But if it is, then you've got something. You've got 
something of value. Uh, so it's not a Ponzi scheme because he's not asking anybody to put any money in. He's giving away Q uh, in order to get enough accounts established to where he can say to venture capitalists, look, uh, we've got a network here. So we've we got, I think the last time I checked, there were something like 10 million registered accounts. Uh, at some point, the idea is to have enough people to make it plausible that it has attained a critical mass of people willing to uh, buy and sell uh, in the units. So that's the idea that there is still, and everybody, there is, it's, it is a kind of a long shot that it will be adopted in a big way, uh, but why not give it a try? That's the uh, philosophy behind it. I'm actually an account holder on Initiative Q, so if anyone wants me to send them an invite so I can be therefore rewarded, uh, feel right. free to reach out to me. Um, but <laughs> yeah, well, I should say as a disclaimer that uh, I got part of my consulting fee in Q, not entirely, but part of it in Q, so that if it ever is worth a dollar a Q, then I will be well set for my retirement. So take my promotion of it with a grain of salt. <laughs> We have an interesting question from Tate Fegley related to the uh, the reading that was sort of assigned for today as background research. Tate, do you want to ask it directly or do you want me to read it out myself? Oh, he's trying to be quiet as to not wake the baby. So I will gladly uh, read it out because <laughs> I'm about to be in those shoes myself in about a month. So why hasn't anyone, to Tate's knowledge, tried to create a cryptocurrency tied to a stable basket of commodities since Hayek and Jaeger seem to think such a currency would be a good idea. And interestingly, one such basket was called ANCAP. And I wonder if that mm -hmm. author was an anarcho-capitalist themselves. No, that, that unit was invented by the economist Robert Hall. And ANCAP stands for ammonium nitrate, copper, aluminum, and plywood. <laughs> it's just a coincidence. It's short for anarcho-capitalism. Uh, and it's an interesting story, and it's kind of a cautionary tale, I think. Hall apparently did a grid search to find a small set of commodities in which in fixed weights tracked the consumer price index. And if you search long enough, you can find one. But if that's how you found it, then it was just accident. And there's no reason to think that going forward, it's gonna to continue to track the CPI. So I had a graduate student years ago, track the ANCAP bundle after Hall published his paper and it was all over the map. So it's a four good bundle um, in fixed weights. To, in the Jaeger and Greenfield proposal, it's basically everything on the Chicago Board of Exchange in some fixed weights. But if you take an index of all commodities and compare it to the CPI, it doesn't track all that closely. Uh, there's a lot more influencing the CPI than raw material prices. Uh, but uh, why doesn't somebody produce a stable coin that's stabilized in terms of a purchasing power index. That is kind of what Ampleforth is trying to do, as I understand it. Uh, but most stable coins are based, I mean, the maker DAO system is a little different. There's some kind of algorithm. But Tether and US dollar coin and others are based on redeemability. They're like banknotes. They promise to buy it back at $1 per unit. And they claim that they have dollar denominated reserves, either bank accounts or treasury bonds uh, to do that with. You can't do that with a CPI bundle. You don't have a, wouldn't be practical to have a warehouse of everything that's in the CPI bundle, especially since a lot of it is services and rent uh, so how do you peg it? Uh, you would need some kind of algorithmic pegging where the supply expands 
if the price starts to go up relative to the index and vice versa. Um, but why there hasn't been somebody launching that uh, that I've heard of, I don't know. So we had another uh, another question uh, who also is uh, voice restricted. So I'll uh, I'll use the moderator's prerogative. Uh, would prices in Bitcoin be problematic because of their relatively deflationary nature compared to the monetary regimes we're quite accustomed to, where some measure of inflation is viewed as a desirable uh, economic and monetary target? Okay, I mean that's a good question. The the Bitcoin program does establish for all future dates how many Bitcoin will be in circulation. And it's currently still growing, but more slowly than it grew last year. So it's growing at somewhere between one and 2% uh, this year until the next event uh, called a halvening in which the growth rates gets cut in half. And eventually it maxes out at 21 million Bitcoins. So let's just jump to the long run where it's fixed. As the economy grows with a fixed money supply, you do expect deflation. Would that kind of deflation be a problem? I don't think it would be a problem once people are accustomed to it and it will be approached, Bitcoin will be approaching it gradually. So it won't be a surprise. Um, what it means is that prices will fall as output grows. And so people will enjoy higher standards of living in real terms, not by their nominal incomes going up, but by prices falling. And that's perfectly feasible. And we saw that under the classical gold standard uh, during, let's say the period between the US Civil War and about 1900, there was a long period of very gradually falling prices but prices were falling because output were, was growing. It wasn't a depression. Uh, some interesting studies have been done by economic historians looking at the correlation between deflation and depression. And under the classical gold standard, there was no correlation. The two things went together in the Great Depression. That's right. And they go together when the deflation is due to a collapse in the money supply, a shrinkage in the money supply. But if the reason prices are falling is rapid growth in output, that's not a depression. And that was the typical case under the classical gold standard. So if you don't have a money supply shrinkage, deflation's not a problem. Right? And then the problem is not the falling prices per se, uh, it's the unsatisfied demand for money that depresses output further. So a uh, deflationary trend is not a problem. And I mean, that's a standard proposition actually in monetary theory, uh, going back to Milton Friedman's article on the optimum quantity of money, that from the point of view of the holders of money, it's nice to have it appreciate. Uh, if money pays lo less interest than a treasury bond, then in a sense, money holders are being taxed and they take costly actions to economize on money balances that they wouldn't have to take, wouldn't take if they were getting the same yield on dollars as on treasury bonds. And if there's no practical way to pay interest on circulating pieces of paper, uh, and I've argued there isn't, then the alternative that Friedman hit upon was to have the interest rate on treasury bonds be zero by having deflation at the real rate of interest. And that's what you get with a fixed money supply and growth in the economy. Uh, so the idea that it's not a problem is a, a, a pretty well established idea. So does anyone else have any questions? I, uh, as usual, have more for Larry, um, but want to give the audience a chance. So this one for Larry will probably be a bit of a softball, but I think it's actually of value for this particular audience and for the, uh, for the topics we're discussing throughout, which is to say cryptocurrencies are a potential unit of account 
issued by a given organization, whether it be, you know, a company like Facebook or a very decentralized network like the Bitcoin network, mm -hmm. they're governed in different ways. Fiat currencies are issued by central banks and are themselves used to achieve targets associated with monetary outcomes, economic outcomes, and even social outcomes more broadly, as we've seen in response to the pandemic. Gold isn't governed this way. And so I'm wondering from your perspective, Larry, what, what are the margins on which gold is different? You know, what is what, and, and feel free to verge into the normative and, and tell us why on some margins gold is superior or feel free to keep it descriptive. But I think it's kind of interesting to contrast those characteristics with the units of account and mediums of exchange that we've been considering throughout today. Good question. And it, it allows me to mention that I'm working on a book now, which is basically gold versus Bitcoin. I mean, the, the working title is better money, gold, fiat or Bitcoin question mark. Uh, but it's basically gold versus Bitcoin. And what are the pluses and minuses of each? Uh, so you're right. The purchasing power of gold is stabilized by market forces, not by a preset uh, release schedule in the case of Bitcoin and not by the mysterious workings of the Federal Open Market Committee uh, in the case of the US dollar. Um, this reminds me, there was a, a piece about an early piece explaining Bitcoin to people. It's like back in 2014 when it was not very well known by a, a Ch Chicago Fed economist. Um, and he said, well, I don't find it very plausible that people would adopt money that's governed by a code that nobody understands. And I looked at that and said, well, if you take out the word code and put in bureaucracy, <laughs> you would think it was implausible that uh, the Fed's uh, money would be widely accepted. Uh, but yeah, gold is governed by forces of supply and demand. Um, and I wish I had uh, a whiteboard to draw supply and demand curves for you, but basically uh, the long run supply of gold curve is pretty flat. So when there's more demand for gold, it does drive up the price in the short run or the purchasing power, I should say, but that sets the miners to work because at a higher value of gold, it pays to dig a little deeper and the long run supply curve is fairly flat because now it pays to go out and prospect some more, uh, look for new sources. Um, although the, the opportunities to find new sources of gold on earth are pretty well exhausted at this point, everything's been mapped. Uh, but anyway, more gold will be produced and most of the increase in demand will be satisfied by an increase in quantity over let's say 20 years. It takes a while to, for the additional flow output of gold to accumulate to the point where it satisfies any sizable increase in demand. Uh, but that means the price level at the 20 year horizon is quite predictable under a gold standard. And as a result of that, you saw long-term bonds, 50 year bonds, even 100 year bonds being commonly issued under the classical gold standard. You don't see that today, even though the inflation rate is now more stable than it used to be, there's no guarantee that it will continue to be in single digits. Um, we, I hope the political consensus that keeps it low continues, but people are rightfully concerned about issuing long-term bonds. What is the dollar gonna be worth in 30 years, 50 years, 100 years? And so I think a practical benefit of a system where the quantity of money is determined by impersonal forces uh, is you don't have to worry about changes in monetary policy fashion. You don't have to worry about modern monetary theory taking over <laughs> if you're on a gold standard. Uh, and so that that is reassuring. Um, now it's not no, there's not going to be any urgent movement to go back to a gold standard, just like there's not going to be any spontaneous people putting themselves on the gold standard, as long as dollar inflation is in the neighborhood of 
Um, but it's good to know that there's an alternative waiting in the wings uh, should it be needed. Gotcha. And so we have literally two minutes left on our flex time for discussion, but I will take another selfish prerogative here and ask you a very quick question, which is to say, when, when might that time be when we've adopted modern monetary theory even more fully? Because I wonder as to the level of dollars we've been just shoveling out the doors of our government in response to the, uh, to the pandemic. And I watched bond rates, bond yields on treasuries briefly go negative at the same time. And so I guess, where do you stand? Is this appetite crazy to you or is it rational? When, when will it end? Well, I think it will certainly uh, taper off. Uh, and I, I think the demand to hold dollars will go down as we recover from the pandemic. So you actually saw a few months of negative inflation uh, earlier this year, despite the Fed turning the printing presses or money printer go burr as the uh, meme has it. <laughs> uh, so where was all that money going? Basically it was being held onto by people who were not spending up to the level of their income the way they used to. They're piling up money balances. And they're doing that because one, the stores weren't open. Uh, they don't wanna travel. They don't wanna go to the movies. And, and two, even if they wanted to, a lot of businesses were shut down. Uh, and secondly, they're worried about keeping their jobs if they still have them. And so uncertainty makes people uh, spend money less eagerly. So the so-called velocity of money goes down. The ratio of money balances to income goes up. And we saw that in 2008, there was a big drop in velocity. And the Fed didn't respond to it, which was a mistake. It, it meant the recession was deeper than it needed to be. But the Fed has responded to this one. Uh, they put, as you said, they put trillions of base money out there. They're gonna have to reabsorb it as the demand for money shrinks again. So they need to be prepared to unwind uh, those operations. And it's not just the monetary base. Unlike in 2008, M2, has also jumped up, but right? people are sitting on it. In, the, in 2008, it was the banks that were sitting on the base money. They've let it go into the publicly held money supply this time, but the public is sitting on it, but that's temporary. It will unwind as people resume normal spending uh, as the economy returns to normal. So the Fed has to be prepared to pull that out if they want to avoid having a, a mistake on the upside of their 2% target, a big mistake. That makes good sense. Um, and so we are actually at the end of our flex time. So I do unfortunately have to say goodbye and uh, thank Larry for his uh, insightful remarks throughout. And just for reiteration, that new book is entitled Better Money, Gold, Fiat, or Bitcoin? I'll, Question mark? I'll let you know when I have a publisher. <laughs> awesome. No, please, uh, and we'd be happy to distribute it to anyone who's interested. But thanks again, unless Jen has anything she'd like to conclude with. No, just thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate your taking the time to be with us today, answering so many questions. And My thanks, pleasure, thanks. Thanks to, to all of you for such great questions and being so engaged. All right. All right, thank you.